back with you once again, and I want to do something a little bit different today than what we normally do around here. Uh, most of the time on these shows, we just kind of talk about things that have happened in our world and in politics and react to them a little bit, give you a reaction to them, give you a perspective on them, and we talk about kind of the here and now and, you know, what happened yesterday and how we react to it. But today I want to do something a little different. I don't want to talk about the here and now. I want to talk a little bit more about a what-if situation. I want to speculate a little bit. I want to look into the future and describe what our reaction should be if a certain series of events happens. Not, not necessarily that these events will happen, but if they do happen, how should we react? Now, what am I talking about? Well, as all of you no doubt understand by now, you've seen any of these shows, you know that I'm an avowed supporter of Herman Cain. He is my pick for the uh, GOP nomination. If I had to select any from that crew, it would be Herman Cain, uh, far and away. And I've supported him since the day he got into the race. But nevertheless, uh, the allegations over the last couple weeks have continued to come down the pike. Uh, the media is bringing out more women every day, it seems like, to uh, cast some sort of aspersion on him. And so they are trying to get Cain out of the race. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, I said just a couple weeks ago on this program, that I didn't care how many women came out. I didn't care what they said. I didn't care if this stuff even turned out to be true. I was still going to support Herman Cain. And the reason for that was that the very things that attracted myself and other voters to Herman Cain do not change because of these allegations, even if they come out to be true. You know, uh, these sexual allegations do not change the fact that Cain has a tremendous amount of experience and high-level experience in business turning around businesses, making them successful. These allegations do not change the fact that up to this point, Cain still has the best tax plan of any of, of the candidates who have come out with a tax plan. His 999 plan is not perfect, I'm not saying it is, but it's the best of what's out there. So the sexual allegations, they don't change that. And these allegations do not change the fact that Herman Cain approaches this candidacy and, and his, his life in business before, and I believe the presidency, that he approaches all of these things through a common sense approach, that he speaks very matter-of-factly, he's very upfront with people, he doesn't try to spin things, he doesn't try to, to give you the safe answer. He'll tell you what he thinks, whether you want to hear it or not. I think that's great. So none of these things that attracted me to Herman Cain uh, from the beginning would change even if some of these allegations turn out to be true. So let's make no mistake, I support Herman Cain, I still support Herman Cain, as long as he's in this race, and I think he should stay in this race until the point that either he decides he doesn't want to be in it, or until he's beaten at the ballot box. This should not be a situation where the media runs him out of the race. But nevertheless, I know he's reassessing things right now. I know he's looking at this in terms of his family. So I wanted to present a what-if scenario to you other Kane supporters and to other conservatives. What if Kane drops out of the race? Again, I'm not saying he should, but if he drops out of the race in the next couple of weeks, what should we conservatives do? What should those of us who have supported Cain do? Should we put our support elsewhere? How should we react? Well, when I look at this question, this hypothetical question, the first thing that I think is that, well, we'll have to go, I, I anyway, we'll have to go and look at the remaining candidates in the GOP. I'm, I'm certainly not going to vote for Obama, you know that. Uh, absolutely no way I could do that. He, I am totally against everything that Barack Obama stands for. Can I make it any more clear than that? So, he is not going to get my vote or my support. You know that. But which of the Republican candidates could get my support? Which of the remaining candidates in a post Kane electorate could potentially get my support? Well, the first thing that I think you have to do is go through a bit of a process of elimination. You look at the candidates that are still out there, and there's about seven of them that still remain. And you say, which of these seven are the people that I absolutely could not support under any circumstances, and you eliminate those candidates? In that group of absolutely couldn't support under any circumstance, I would place two people, Mitt Romney and John Huntsman. Those are the two people in the GOP uh, primaries right now that under no circumstances could I support. So I have to eliminate them from my consideration. Why couldn't I support Mitt Romney? Well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, he's flip-flopped on every issue known to man. He's, if you look at his career, he's never been a staunch conservative. You can call him a moderate, but even that's being a little charitable. And of course, he had Romney care in Massachusetts. And make no mistake, Romney has never apologized for Romney care. He's never backed down off of Romney care. And he's never abandoned the idea of government involvement in health care. 
I know he's gone so far as to try and say, well, Obama did something differently and it shouldn't be done at the federal level, it should be done at the state level, but make no mistake, those smoke screens are trying to obscure the point that Romney has not thrown out the idea of government involvement in health care. In fact, earlier this week on Fox News, an interview with Brett Baer, Romney essentially doubled down on Romney Care. He said, and I'm quoting from his interview, quoting from Romney here, I'm standing by what I did in Massachusetts. I'm not trying to dust it aside. I'm absolutely firm that it was the right thing for our state. I'll defend that, and I understand it has political implications, and if it keeps me from winning a primary, so be it. Wow. So Romney doubles down on what he did in Massachusetts. He's not apologized for Romney Care. He's not abandoned the idea of government-controlled health care. He just wants to do it a little bit differently than Barack Obama. Maybe he doesn't want to do it at the federal level. Maybe he does. I don't know. But in any case, Romney does not realize that the conservatives and the Republicans and the American people, quite frankly, are not objecting to Obamacare just because of that particular form of health care. We have rejected the very idea of government involvement in health care in any way, shape, or form. Romney is not with us on that. Therefore, Romney is the enemy. Romney is a martyr. Romney might as well be a Democrat as far as I'm concerned. He's a son of a jackass. He's a lover of chickens. He has a one-track mind the same way a hog does at supper time or slop time. Well, yeah, there's that too. So Romney is absolutely off my list. John Huntsman, I mentioned his name as someone I couldn't support. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on John Huntsman because, frankly, he's not terribly relevant right now. I don't even know why he's still in the race. But if you go back to his debate performances, you can see he is disgustingly moderate on a number of issues. He does believe in the idea of a federal government. He does believe in a safety net for this country. So, no, I can't support him. But you know something? And I hate to give, I hate to potentially give my enemies ideas. I'm hesitant to say this, but... If John Huntsman truly wanted to become president, if he truly wants to become president at some point in his life, you know what he could do? And I don't want him to do this because it could be trouble for us in the Republican Party. But if John Huntsman truly wanted to be president, his best bet would be to drop out of this campaign, leave the Republican Party, become a Democrat, and then in 2016, try to run as a Democrat against the incumbent Republican that's going to win in 2012. Now, some of you are laughing and you think I'm nuts and whatever else, but think about that. In that scenario, John Huntsman could portray himself as a common-sense Democrat or a moderate Democrat or could link himself back to, you know, kind of the Truman Democrats and that kind of thing, even, even the Clintonian Democrats as much as I don't like them. That would be very appealing to the American people, and I'll tell you what. If Huntsman did that, he would be a tough out in 2016. I certainly wouldn't support him, but for whoever the sitting Republican president is at that time, Huntsman could be a pretty tough guy to run against. If I'm a political advisor working for John Huntsman, that's, that's the way I'm going to send him. I'm going to say drop out of the Republican Party, become a Democrat, kind of stay out of trouble for four years, and run as a common sense Democrat as though such a thing exists. He might, be, he might make it a pretty close race if he did that. I hope nobody in his camp heard that because that can make him dangerous down the road. But for this election, let's realize John Huntsman is not one of us. He's never going to be one of us. He's never going to be a staunch conservative. So let's just discount him. He's not even in the mix. So you've taken those two out of, the, out of the group. There's five left. Well, there's one of those five that I almost put in that can't support him under any circumstances group. There's one amongst that five that I almost eliminated but not quite. And that one is Ron Paul. Ron Paul, as you've heard me say before, and I don't want to spend a ton of time on him because he's not going to be there at the end, but I know I've got to mention him because his little politards out there that follow him around on the internet, they'll fill my inbox up if I don't, so let's address him. Ron Paul is pretty good on the domestic issues. I agree with a lot of what he says. Social issues, he's not so good, but I could tolerate him if push came to shove. But foreign policy, he's abysmal. Foreign policy, Ron Paul will get us killed. So I almost come to the point of saying I can't support Ron Paul under any circumstances. I, I fear for what would happen to our nation uh, overseas 
And with people trying to, to do things in our country in terms of terrorism and, and invasion and that kind of thing, I fear what might happen if Ron Paul came about. I hate to say it, but I would almost say that I'm more comfortable with Barack Obama's foreign policy than I would be Ron Paul's. And you have no idea how sickening it is for me to say that. And don't get me wrong, I'm against the Obama foreign policy. I don't think he's done nearly enough to, you know, to project American dominance abroad and to project American culture abroad and American values. He's done a horrible job at that. But at the same time, Osama bin Laden was, was executed on his watch. Muammar Gaddafi was executed on his watch. Those are a couple of positive things. Now, they happened because Obama parlayed and continued on the George W. Bush foreign policy, which was smart for him to do. It was the safest thing he could have done for the American people. He'll never admit it. But you have to give the Bush foreign policy credit for bin Laden and Gaddafi being killed. But there again, it did happen under Obama's watch. So frankly, looking at Obama's foreign policy, as much as I disagree with it, and looking at Paul's foreign policy, or the lack thereof, I'm actually more comfortable with Obama's. Ooh, I hate to say that. But that lets you know the uphill climb Ron Paul would have with conservatives like me. I'm not willing to throw them all the way out of the campaign yet, but I'm really going to have to think it through if, if he's in there towards the end. So, we eliminate Romney and Huntsman because there's no way I can support him. We sort of eliminate Ron Paul because he scares the hell out of me. That leaves us with four people. That leaves us with Michelle Bachman, Rick Santorum, Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich. Now, of those Gingriches, the front runner among the four right now, Perry is hanging in there. Bachman and Santorum are way back but are sticking in. However, despite all of the polls and, and conventionalism and all that, I would say with those four candidates, and don't get me wrong, I have issues with every one of the four on some level, but with those four candidates, if the nomination ends up going to one of those four, at the end of the day, I could support him, I could campaign for him, and I could, I could, eagerly, I could eagerly support them against Barack Obama. Uh, doesn't mean that I agree with everything that the four say. In fact, you've seen me go off on Newt Gingrich a lot on this show, particularly last week. He gave that answer on illegal immigration in the last debate that was unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. And he must be called on the carpet for that. But in the bigger picture, could I support any of those four? Yes, I could. Are there positives to each of those four? Yes, there are. Are there negatives to each of those four? Yes, there are. In the case of Michelle Bachman, she's very positive on the social issues, very positive on the fiscal issues, but I'm, you know, foreign policy-wise, she's good, but I, I think she might, she might be willing to negotiate a little too much with Pakistan. I'm not real sure about that. But by and large, I like Michelle Bachman. It's a shame to me that she's as far back in the polling as she is, because she's saying a lot of the right things. Rick Santorum, likewise, he's way back in the polling, but for my money, Rick Santorum is the best of the bunch on social issues. For my money, Rick Santorum is among the best of the bunch, bunch on foreign policy issues. I mean, he had a, he's had a couple of moments in some of these debates that I think have gone under the radar, that people haven't really talked about much, but he's had some great answers on a couple of issues. Let's look, first of all, I want to go back to some of these debates, I'll show you a clip here. Let's look at Rick Santorum's answer when it came to uh, profiling and, and religious profiling, racial profiling in terms of the war on terror. Here's how Rick Santorum responded when asked about profiling in the war on terror. Hit. So just to be precise, is it ethnic profiling, religious profiling? Who would be profiled? Well, the folks who are most likely to be committing these crimes, if you look at it, I mean, obviously it was people, uh, obviously Muslims would be, a, would be someone you'd look at, absolutely. Those are the folks who are the radical Muslims are the people that, that are committing these crimes, as we've, uh, by, by and large, as well as younger males. I mean, these are things that, uh, not exclusively, but these are things that you profile to, uh, to, to find your best, uh, the most likely candidate. Well, I think that was a pretty positive answer. I'll come, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of, Candidates would kind of beat around the bush and so forth. A lot of Republicans would beat around the bush. I won't. I'll tell you flat out. I think we should be profiling in this war. I will come out and say that. I think, I think we should be profiling on the basis of religion. We should be profiling on the basis of race. We should be profiling on the basis of age and gender. We should be doing those things. We are at war. So if some discrimination has to happen in order to protect ourselves, Yes, discriminate. I'm all for it. So I like Rick Santorum's answer on that. 
Likewise, Rick Santorum had a great answer when it came to talking about the root of poverty in this country. This is from the Bloomberg debate. Hit it. But the biggest problem with poverty in America, we don't talk about here because it's an economic discussion, and that is the breakdown of the American family. You want to look at the poverty rate among families that have, two, have a husband and wife working in them? It's 5% today. A family that's headed by one person, it's 30% today. We need to do something. We need to talk about econ economics. The home, the word home in Greek is the basis of the word economy. It is, it is the foundation of our country. We need to have a policy that supports families, that encourages marriage, All right. has uh, fathers take responsibility for their children. You can't have limited government. You can't have a wealthy society if the family breaks down that basic unit of society, and that needs to be included. You know something? I don't know that any other candidate has come out with an answer that good in terms of the root causes of poverty in this country. So Rick Santorum does a great job there. Now, there are things I dislike about Rick Santorum. I think he's a little too attached to the idea of the federal government. I think he's a little too attached to the idea of a federal safety net for Americans. Uh, you know, he, he's the one guy that you've never heard talk about any sort of cuts to social... Well, I don't want to say cuts. He, he has talked about that. But he hasn't talked about the phasing out of Social Security. He's talked about doing Social Security different so it can last for future generations. That's not what I want to hear. Rick Santorum will never say that Social Security was a mistake. Rick Santorum will never say that Medicare is a mistake. Rick Santorum supported Medicare Part D and still supports it today. Those are things I dislike about him. I don't know that he truly understands the negative consequences that our country faces from the social programs we've, we've put into place. He wants to do them differently, he wants to formulate them differently, but he doesn't want to phase them out, and that's where I have a problem with him. But, on a lot of other issues, he's right as rain. Rick Perry, well, Rick Perry's had some pretty tough debate performances, but I told you all along that debate performances in and of themselves don't really sway my vote. Perry has been conservative at times, but he's kind of tried to qualify some of those conservative statements and back off some things. You remember early when he got in the process, uh, a lot of the, the media brought up some of his comments in a book about, you know, Social Security being a Ponzi scheme and so forth, and he kind of backed off of those statements a little bit, or tried to deflect them, and, and I didn't like that. Uh, there is, of course, the issue for uh, tuition, for uh, children of illegal immigrants. That was a, a horrible, horrible thing, and, and that's something that is unacceptable. But uh, I don't always know where Rick Perry's coming from. I don't know that I trust Rick Perry totally. I don't know how much of this is him trying to become president, and how much of this is he is really a dyed-in-the-wool conservative. But... If push came to shove and he's the nominee, I could get behind him. And then finally, Newt Gingrich. You heard me last week talk about his views on illegal immigration. Totally unacceptable. I think he needs to back off of that. You remember several months back, I think it was May, I ripped into Newt Gingrich because he criticized uh, people that he, he said were trying to, to undergo right-wing social engineering. As I said then, and I'll say it now, this country could use some good right-wing social engineering. I wouldn't be turning my back on that, Mr. Gingrich. So Gingrich is another one of these that won't come out and say, we've got to get rid of Social Security. He will not say we've got to phase these programs out. He's a little bit like Santorum in that he wants to do these programs a different way. He's not willing to throw in a towel on them. And then there's Gingrich's past. Not the marriages. I don't really care about that. The past of kind of going along with whatever the political... Uh, political wave was at the time. I remember him sitting on that couch with Nancy Pelosi touting how we have to do something with global warming. You know, that idea that doesn't really exist. So I don't trust Gingrich either. That being said, while his career has been kind of here and there and everywhere, he has consistently showed some sort of allegiance to the conservative movement. So if I had to support him, I could. So of the four main candidates, here's the order on the screen. Here's the order that I would support them in. I would, I would be most enthusiastic to support Michelle Bachman. I could also support Rick Santorum. I think those two candidates, even being far back in the polls, if Herman Cain gets out, I think we need to take a little closer look at those two candidates. Flawed to some extent, but I think they're the most conservative candidates of anybody. But number three, I would support Rick Perry. Number four, I'd support Newt Gingrich. In fact, you might even support, you might even consider Perry and Gingrich to be number three in 3A. There's a definite step back between those two 
from Botman and Santorum, but in a pinch I could support either one of them. I could not support Mitt Romney. I could not support John Huntsman. And I'm not sure if I, should, if I could support Ron Paul in a pinch. But the four that would remain in a post Kane electorate, if we get to that point, the four that would remain that we could, that we could consider potential candidates are Michelle Bachman, Rick Santorum, Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, in that order. You know, from the start of this primary process, people have said that the Republicans cannot find a good candidate. The Republicans cannot find a suitable candidate. I disagree with that. I've just given you four suitable candidates. I've just given you four good candidates. Are all of them flawed? Yes. Are any of them the perfect candidate? No. But when you really think about it, 200 plus years we've had as a nation, we have never seen a perfect presidential candidate at any point. Even guys like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, as great as they were, they were not perfect. They can't be perfect. They're human beings. Everybody, everybody running for these offices are human beings. So perfection is out of the question. I still think we should pursue perfection. I still think we should have the expectation of perfection because that will then get us to the point of getting the best possible candidate. So there's nothing wrong with chasing perfection. There's nothing wrong with expecting perfection. But I think we all deep down understand that nobody's going to be perfect in the end. And that's okay. I think it's worthwhile for us to kick the tires on all of these candidates, which is what we've been doing since this whole thing started. And everybody says the, the right and the conservatives are in disarray. We're really not. We are simply trying to find the best possible candidate of the bunch. I still think that's Herman Cain as long as he's in the race. But if he were to bow out, there's a few people behind him that not only could beat Barack Obama, because let's face it, Anybody can beat Obama at this point, but could actually make a positive change for this country, could get us back in the right direction. I think Bachman and Santorum would be the best of what remains, but I could deal with Perry, I could deal with Gingrich as a last resort. That's where I stand right now. That, that's my Kane contingency plan. That's what I will do if Kane gets out, but I hope we don't get there. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.